Hello, 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 hello. Believe it or not, this is Dr. Pete Mandic once again, here to talk to you about philosophy. And we are continuing to talk about epistemology, the branch of philosophy that studies knowledge itself. And in this lecture, we're going to focus on a claim in epistemology, the study of knowledge, a claim that maybe there isn't much knowledge or a lot of the things that people thought they knew about they don't actually know. And we are going to be focusing in particular on a kind of version of that that is specifically about the external world, the world that lives outside of your head, the world that's external to your mind. A lot of what we're going to be talking about are certain scenarios that you might think of are just like really, really far out. Why would anyone ever wonder about that or, or need to take it seriously? The scenario that maybe you are just a brain in a vat. You think you have a, a body besides your brain. You think you have hands. But maybe that's just a weird dream or hallucination that a brain, your brain, is having because it's plugged into a machine, a computer that's giving it information directly. Information which is almost entirely wrong. So here's a brain in a vat and the vat is floating in outer space and the brain thinks it's got a, a regular human body and it's standing on the beach looking at the waves and it thinks it even knows that it it thinks it knows that it's standing on a beach and, and looking at the water and the ocean but really there is no beach there is no ocean there's just cold cold space and the brain floating in its vat and one of the things we're going to talk about is how Thinking about skepticism actually helps us understand knowledge and maybe helps us better understand our relationship to the actual external world. So let's get into it. Here's an outline of what we're going to do in this lecture. First, we're going to talk about the definition of skepticism and different general kinds of skepticism. We're going to distinguish skepticism in general from specific kinds of skepticism, especially skepticism about the external world. And then next we're going to define a certain kind of hypothesis that's related to skepticism. And in a lot of ways, this part right here, part two, is one of the most difficult and important parts of this whole lecture. So when you're studying for the, the quiz, this might be the part to make sure you really understand it correctly. What it means to be arguing for a skeptical hypothesis or what it means to be instead arguing for something else, but using the skeptical hypothesis. And then in parts three, four, and five, we're going to look at three kinds of skeptical hypotheses that have come up in the historical literature about this stuff. These are independently interesting. It's interesting to think about what they all have in common. It's interesting to think about what might be different about them. And you might be already familiar with one or more of them. Versions of these show up in different movies, uh, science fiction movies and, and TV shows. And you might recognize that like, oh yeah, I saw a movie once where they basically had Plato's cave or it was basically a version of a brain in a vat. Okay, let's talk about the definition of skepticism. It's, as we're using it in this philosophical context, it's the view that no one knows anything. Or we might put it by saying that it's the view that no one uh, knows what they think they know. Lots of people might claim to know things and the skeptic says they're wrong. Now there's other uses of the word skeptic and skepticism and it's worth knowing what they are and making sure that you don't get confused and, and think we're talking about that other thing. So sometimes what it means for someone to be skeptical is that they're not very trusting. They don't just trust everything that they hear. They, they want to subject it to a, a little bit more certainty uh, or scrutiny before they um, make a judgment about whether they're going to believe it or not. You might say that that use of skepticism, skepticism is something like the opposite of gullibility. Uh, someone who is gullible, they just believe everything that they hear. They're, oh, okay, yeah, sounds good. And they're fun to <laughs> play tricks on. You can get them to believe all sorts of crazy things. Um, 
a skeptic, though, is protecting themselves from being fooled. They are on the lookout for bullshitters, and they don't want to get uh, deceived. And so they're very careful in the way in which they examine evidence, and they don't want to rush to conclusions. So that's one use of the word skepticism. But this other use of the word skepticism, the one that we're focusing on in this lecture, is more than just an attitude of a reserving judgment, but it's a particular kind of belief, and it's a belief about knowledge, and it's the claim that, in general or for specific sorts of knowledge claims, those claims are false. The people don't actually have the knowledge that they claim to have. So that's the general sense of skepticism as it applies to this portion of epistemology. Now, in that sense of the word skepticism, where you're claiming that there isn't such and such knowledge, there's different kinds of that. There's different kinds of skepticism. So one kind of skepticism is a skepticism that just focuses on claims about God. Another word for this skepticism about God is agnosticism. And agnostic is someone who claims that you can't know whether God exists. They may not be skeptical about anything else, just this God thing. Um, you might instead have a focused skepticism that's about causation. And this is something that we talked about a little bit in connection with empiricism and especially the empiricistic philosophy of the philosopher David Hume. And that's skepticism about causation. So maybe God exists. You, you don't care. You're not even talking about that. You want to talk about causation. And a lot of people claim to know that this causes that. And the skeptic about causation says, no, you can't have knowledge of causation. Maybe there's causation. Maybe there isn't, but you can't have knowledge of it. Another kind of skepticism is skepticism about other minds. Maybe the way you know about your own mind is very different from the way you would know about anyone else's mind if they even had one. So maybe the way you know about your own mind is that you can just introspect. You just look inside and see that it's there. You are aware of your own mind, maybe because you can't even possibly doubt that you have a mind. The attempt to doubt is a mental process. So just by doubting, you automatically know you're engaging in a mental process, so therefore you have a mind. So, at least some philosophers argue, your knowledge of your own mind is very direct and very certain and very solid. It's unshakable. You can't really doubt that you yourself have a mind. But what about other people's minds and other people's mental states? How do you know that they have minds? And you might say, it's just obvious. Like, look at them. This, you know, this guy over here looks happy. I can tell he has a happy mental state. He's smiling. He's, you know, seems really upbeat. He says things like, yeah, I'm having a good day. And I see this person over here. She just, uh, she's crying. She she's, looks really sad. She acts really sad when she gets up and walks around. She's just like kind of mopey. But according to this line of thought, you don't really know that they have minds. Because all you're really observing is their bodies, their faces. That's part of their body, too. You're observing their outward behavior. And the things they say, that's just verbal behavior. The way they move, the way they move their mouth and make sounds with their voice, that that you have access to by sensory observation. You can observe their body and the behavior of their body. And speaking is just more behavior. It's verbal behavior. And you draw an inference based on those observations that maybe those behaviors are caused by mental states. Maybe they are acting happy because they have a happy mental state. But for all you know, they don't have a happy mental state. Isn't it possible that they're really just like robots that have no mental states at all and are merely going through the motions? Anyway, that's skepticism about other minds. We're going to be focusing on something else. It's skepticism about the external world. And it's kind of related to something I was saying earlier that many philosophers think that the knowledge you have of your own mind is very solid and unshakable and certain. And if you take that kind of knowledge as a model for knowledge, like the, the purest example of what you know is that you have a mind, then maybe the claim that you know anything that would be external to your mind starts to look shaky. And that's the kind of externalism 
I'm sorry, that's the kind of skepticism we're going to be focusing on for the rest of this lecture, is skepticism about the external world. What's the external world? It's the world that is outside of your mind. This, if, like, if there was one, it would be outside of your mind. It's skepticism about that. So it's not skepticism about everything. It's not the claim that there's no knowledge at all. It's just the claim that there's no knowledge of the external world. That whenever I say skepticism for the rest of this lecture, I'm going to be talking, what I mean is skepticism about the external world. Okay, so I, earlier I said one of the pieces of terminology that you're going to need to know in terms of all this is, besides what skepticism is, is what a skeptical hypothesis is. What is a skeptical hypothesis? And I also said this is going to be a little bit difficult for many students to really get a grip on. It's a little bit complicated, and uh, I'm confident that you'll get it anyway. But it is a little bit hard. So um, a skeptical hypothesis, we might say, is a, uh, we might put it in terms of a skeptical hypothetical, a hypothetical scenario. So what is a hypothetical scenario in general? Aside from skeptical ones, what are, what are hypothetical scenarios? Hypothetical scenarios are scenarios that maybe aren't happening right now, but they could be happening. You say, well, what if? Um, so, for example, um, I'm, in a, uh, I'm in a car and all the windows are open, and then I say, well, <laughs> what if it rained? It's not raining right now, but what if it rained? Um, I might pull in somewhere and park the car, and, uh, and it's a really safe neighborhood. I'm thinking about just leaving the windows open. But then I ask myself, what if it rained? Uh, well, the water might go in my car. And, uh, and then I say, well, I'm just running inside to, to grab uh, a few things from, from the store. It'll be really quick. I'll probably be back in five minutes. What if it rained for just five minutes? Would the car be okay? So what I'm doing is I'm entertaining hypothetical scenarios. I'm thinking about like, well, what if it did rain? It's not raining right now, but what if it did? Um, the windows aren't open right now, but what if they were? Those are hypothetical scenarios. And now let's focus on a specific kind of hypothetical scenario. It's a hypothetical scenario where if that scenario was true, you wouldn't know something that you ordinarily think you know. So um, here's an example of a thing you ordinarily think you know. You ordinarily think you know when your, um, your phone is ringing. Most of you have phones, and sometimes even you um, keep your phones in your pocket. My phone is right here. It's not in. It's not in my pocket. But sometimes, sometimes I put it in my pocket, and sometimes I have it on uh, vibrate. And so I know my phone is ringing because I feel it vibrating. Okay, and I think a lot of people say like, "Yeah, that's a thing I know. I know when my phone is ringing." Okay, but here's a hypothetical scenario. Uh, maybe you are having one of those weird hallucinations that happen to a lot of people, where you feel your phone, like your phone vibrating in your pocket, and your phone not only is not vibrating in your pocket, your phone isn't even in your pocket. This happens to a lot of people. If it hasn't happened to you, maybe you've heard of people that it happens to. Um, you get so like used to that process of the vibrating going off and telling you that your phone is ringing that sometimes like you won't even have your phone on you, but there'll be like you'll be in a car and it bumps a little bit or jostles a little bit. And your brain interprets that as the feeling of the phone vibrating. Okay, so imagine this. You, uh, you think your phone has just vibrated in your pocket. But <laughs> before you reach down and check to see if there's a phone, you ask yourself, is it possible that my phone is not in my pocket right now? If my phone wasn't in my pocket right now, then I wouldn't know that my phone was ringing. So that's a hypothetical scenario. It's a hypothetical scenario in which if that scenario was true, then you wouldn't actually know the thing that you think you know. You think you know that your phone is ringing, but if your phone wasn't in your pocket, like maybe your phone was too, like, 
two houses away. You were down the street at a friend's house and you left your phone there. And uh, by coincidence, your phone actually is ringing when you're having this hallucination of your, of, uh, of your phone vibrating in your pocket. So it's true that your phone is ringing, but you don't know that your phone is ringing. It's just a weird, lucky situation. You just happen to be having this hallucination at that moment while your phone is ringing. Okay, so this is getting complicated. Let's put it all together. So here's a situation. It has occurred to you that maybe your phone is ringing. Why? Because it feels to you like it's vibrating in your pocket. But now wait a minute, just for the sake of conversation, entertain this hypothesis. Isn't it possible, without looking down, don't check, don't touch your pocket, isn't it possible that your phone is two doors down and you're just hallucinating that the phone is vibrating in your pocket. Isn't that possible? Now, what if that was actual? What if that was actually what was happening? Would you, in that moment, know that your phone was ringing? I think a lot of people see that it's clear that in that moment you wouldn't know that your phone is ringing. If your phone wasn't in your pocket ringing and it was actually several hundred feet away from you, you wouldn't know that it was ringing. Even if, as a matter of fact, by coincidence, it happened to be ringing. That's, a, that's an example of a skeptical hypothesis. Here's another skeptical hypothesis. Maybe I'm dreaming right now. Or you might say this to yourself, maybe I'm dreaming right now. Maybe I'm dreaming right now that I'm watching a video. Hypothetically, you're dreaming right now, and it's uh, maybe a really boring dream where you're just sitting and watching a video for some class about philosophy. Lots of us have boring dreams. Some of us have dreams that we go to work, and that's kind of a ripoff, right? You like work all day, and then you go home, go to sleep, try to get some rest, and then you have a dream about being at work. Sometimes it's a really realistic dream. You put in an eight-hour shift, and then you wake up, and that was all a dream, and now you got to get up and go to work again. It's a big ripoff, and you're not getting paid for working in your dream. I, My work is a philosophy philosophy professor. That's what I do for a job. And I have had dreams in which I was at work. That means I have had dreams where I was in a class and giving a lecture to a bunch of philosophy students. And it has happened to me a couple times now that I am lecturing about whether maybe we are all dreaming. And in the lecture, in the dream lecture, I say, obviously, we're not dreaming right now. Obviously, this is real. And I invite the students to look at like, look at the back of your hand, look at like all the little hairs and pores or you know uh take take the nearest book or piece of paper and, and that you have and look at like all the little tiny details and all the little fibers and stuff you could see on the surface of your desk or something like that isn't that amazing that couldn't possibly be in a dream obviously we're not dreaming right now and then i wake up <laughs> wow um so here's a here's a skeptical hypothesis maybe you're dreaming right now now Am I arguing that you are dreaming right now? Am I trying to convince you that you are dreaming right now? No, I'm just asking you to imagine that you are dreaming right now. I'm asking you to think about what would follow if you were actually dreaming right now. What follows from that? Well, one thing that follows from that is that um, it's possible that there's no actual philosophy professor talking to you right now. I think there's a guitar right here. I think I know that there's a guitar here. I can feel it. Making guitar noises. But maybe I'm dreaming right now. If I'm dreaming right now, what's really happening is I'm in bed laying down. I'm not touching a guitar. I'm not anywhere near a guitar. So I think there's a guitar there, but do I know that there's a guitar there? Well, hypothetically, it's, I'm just dreaming. If I was just dreaming, that I wouldn't know that there's a guitar there. That's a skeptical hypothesis. So the sorts of things that we're going to be studying in the rest of this lecture are these famous skeptical hypotheses, like, for example, the hypothesis that you're dreaming, or there's one we could call the matrix hypothesis. It's kind of a version of the brain in the vat hypothesis, and it was made famous in the Matrix movies. A lot of you have seen the Matrix and the sequels, Matrix Reloaded, uh, and Matrix... Um, Part three. I forgot. <laughs> it wasn't that good. Anyway, um, other skeptical hypotheses are maybe I'm on drugs. 
maybe somebody slipped me some really powerful hallucinogenic drugs a few minutes ago. I didn't realize it. They were playing a really mean, nasty, and frankly illegal trick on me. They put some LSD in my oatmeal or something like that, and I'm hallucinating. I, I think, I think there's a bottle of water in my hand right now, but maybe that's just a hallucination. If it was just a hallucination, then I wouldn't know that there's a bottle of water in my hand, even though it seems to me like there's a bottle of water in my hand. Okay, so other skeptical hypotheses besides I've been drugged or I'm dreaming are things like, wait, maybe I'm insane. Maybe I have gone crazy. I've lost my mind. Um, it hasn't happened to me yet. I haven't ever lost my mind, but some people do. It does happen to people. And um, often when it happens to them, they don't know that it's happening. They don't realize that they've lost their mind. They just take it completely for granted that, you know, um, there's a, the FBI is chasing after them, um, or they're receiving telepathic signals from, um, the Pope. It just seems normal to them, but really they have lost their mind. Um, well, maybe that's happening to you right now and you're hallucinating or deluded in thinking that you're watching a philosophy video, but really you're just, you're just in prison somewhere without any videos, without anything to do, and you're just experiencing a weird sort of dream or hallucination. One of the famous and, and oldest versions of this goes back to the philosopher Plato, and it's his allegory of the cave, Plato's story of the cave. And here's a drawing of the cave, but he described this in words. And he says, imagine, imagine a group of people who spent their entire lives chained up in a cave, a bunch of slaves chained up in a cave, and they're forced to stare at this wall upon which shadows are being cast. And they never look away from the wall. They just look directly at the wall and at the shadows, and they've spent their whole life looking at these shadows, and they come to believe that's real reality. Real reality is a bunch of shadows. They don't know that behind them are people holding these objects up and light is coming from a fire casting shadows onto a wall. They don't realize that there's there's people that have captured them and enslaved them. It happened so long ago. They were very small children when it happened. They don't remember it at all. Their whole reality to them is just these shadows. And imagine some of the people that are looking at the shadows are really good at looking at the shadows, really good at remembering the different things the shadows do. They're kind of like experts of the shadows, and they take a lot of pride in their ability to predict, like, well, after this horse shadow jumps through the ring shadow, it's going to go try to lick the vase. And the, and the other people are like, oh, wow, what a smart, smart guy, this expert of the shadows. They have no idea that real reality is this larger world, including a world outside of the cave. And now imagine that someone escapes from their imprisonment and they go out into the external world for the first time seeing more than just shadows, seeing the more than just the light that's cast from this fire. They are out in the full glory of the sun. What's going to happen? Well, one thing that might happen, says Plato, is that they're going to be dazzled by the sun. They'll be blinded by it. They'll hardly be able to see. And maybe eventually they'll get used to it and be able to appreciate that this reality is the real reality. The things that they can see in the light of the actual sun is so much more rich and varied and real than the shadows that they saw in the cave. But now imagine that they go back into the cave and they tell the other people, the ones that didn't escape, about this world outside of the cave. What reaction might the people in the cave have to this person who escaped and then came back to tell them about the truth? They might reject him as a fool. They might say, look, uh, the expert is Joe Schmo here. He knows all about the shadows and he knows that there's no world outside the cave. You're an idiot. You're a fool. You're a madman. And they might reject him as just, he's the one that's nuts. And he realizes that, no, he's the one that has a grip on real reality. They're the ones that are deluded and deceived. So that's the gist of Plato's cave, and there's a lot of interesting aspects of it. And this has been depicted in a lot of different ways, and we're going to take just a little break to look at a short video clip that depicts Plato's cave. And, and we'll come back after the video clip and discuss further the story of Plato's cave and some of the
different things it might symbolize and and most importantly what it might mean for us and epistemology. So I'll see you in a little bit. Imagine prisoners that have spent their entire lives chained deep inside a cave. They have been chained so that they cannot see behind themselves and they are forced to stare endlessly at the cave wall in front of them. Behind them a fire is burning and between the prisoners and the fire is a raised walkway. Now imagine that each day a menagerie of objects crosses the walkway. Animals and people carrying their wares to market. Their shapes create an intricate shadow play on the wall in front of the prisoners. This is the only world that the prisoners have ever known. The shadows and the echoes of unseen objects. Now, imagine that a prisoner is released. After some time adjusting to the blinding light, the freed prisoner will begin to experience the world outside of the cave for the very first time. And it is like nothing he could have ever imagined. With his new perception of the world, the man will of course want to return to his friends to share his incredible discoveries. But the prisoners cannot recognize their old friend. He appears as all things do. His voice is a distorted echo, and his body is a grotesque shadow. They cannot understand his fantastic stories of the world outside of the cave. To them, it will never exist. This, of course, does not make the world outside of the cave any less real. Well, I hope you enjoyed that video clip. Um, so let's talk a little bit about some of the different aspects of that video clip. So you've got the people that, that were in the cave, and um, you might really wonder, like, well, do they know? What are, what are some of the things that they might claim? Do they know that the only things in, in, that exist are two-dimensional things, flat things? That the only things that exist are these dark things that are surrounded by a flat area of whiteness. Do they know that? They might say that, but do they know it? You might say, well, there's no, no, of course they don't know it because that would be false. It's false that all of reality is just a bunch of shadows on a flat surface. In truth, uh, uh, reality is much larger and it's three dimensional and there's all sorts of colors, many more colors than they can see and many more shapes than they can see more dimensions than just two dimensions. They don't have knowledge because all the things they think they know are actually false things. They have mostly false beliefs. And if you have a false belief, you don't have knowledge. So here is a skeptical hypothesis. Maybe you are in Plato's cave. Maybe you have been captured and you are in a cave right now. And what you think you're experiencing isn't real reality. It's just some kind of shadow of the real reality. And you might say, I don't get it. Like, I don't get how what I'm looking at right now, like I'm looking at a guitar, I'm looking at a person in a video. How can that just be shadows? And maybe we need to expand the metaphor a little bit. And this is why the brain in a vat is a little bit more um, discussed in contemporary settings because the brain in a vat it seems a little bit more in some sense easier to imagine that um, maybe we 
right now our brains advance. That's a little easier to get your head around than maybe we are literally locked up in a cave right now looking at shadows. But nonetheless, there's some aspects of the, the cave story that are worth thinking about. One is, who is the escapee? Who's the person that escapes? Who do they, what do they symbolize? And one obvious answer is that they symbolize the philosopher. <laughs> this is very flattering to someone like me who's a professor of philosophy. Like, oh yeah, the hero of the story is the philosophy professor. Yeah, I like that. I like that interpretation. Uh, makes me feel good about myself. But you might say, more broadly, this is the person who's not full of shit. This is the person who is not a not buffaloed, not easily hoodwinked. They're able to think outside the box, think outside the cave. They reject authority. They reject people telling them what to think, and they try to think on their own and try to really get to the heart of the matter. This is what's symbolized by the person who escapes from the cave. And we might, just for simplicity, call them the philosopher, but it doesn't necessarily have to be a philosophy professor. It could be anybody that seeks wisdom, and many of you seek wisdom and are thus philosophers. So the philosopher escapes, and what does the philosopher do in the story? Well, the philosopher tries to go back and help everybody else. The philosopher doesn't just stay outside the cave and then try to get rich with all his new knowledge. He feels an obligation to go back and to try to liberate the people that are enslaved by their ignorance. Another thing that happens in the story is that he is rejected. His, his offer to help them is laughed at, and they reject him. Plato's teacher, Socrates, was killed by the Athenians. They, put him to, they sentenced him to death. Um, and you might think that this story is in part a commentary on what happened to Plato's teacher, Socrates. But let's focus on the epistemological issues, and that is the question of what do we know and can our knowledge be undermined by contemplating skeptical hypotheses, like, for example, that maybe we're dreaming, or maybe we're hallucinating, or maybe we're imprisoned and being shown some kind of illusion. One of the most powerful, from a logical point of view, skeptical hypotheses is one that is discussed in connection with the philosophy of Rene Descartes. This is Rene Descartes' hypothesis of a deceitful demon. The deceitful demon is... Maybe you can think of the demon as Satan or the devil. Um, Descartes wasn't trying to make a specifically religious point, and Satan and the devil are religious characters. He was saying just hypothetically, what if there was a being that was super, super powerful, as powerful as God is supposed to be, but unlike God, is not good. God is supposed to be good, <clears throat> but imagine a being that is powerful, as powerful as God, but not all good. <clears throat> what could that being do? Couldn't that being fool you about all sorts of things? Now, why is Descartes talking about this? Why is he talking about a deceitful demon? Well, he's trying to do a thing in epistemology. He's trying to figure out what he knows, and he's examining the various things that he believes, and he's wondering whether any of these beliefs are solid, whether they're anything that he could use as a foundation upon which to build up a body of knowledge, a body of science. So he's employing something that he calls the method of doubt. He is subjecting all of his beliefs to doubts and seeing if there's any beliefs that are left over that cannot be doubted. But now if you're going to doubt your beliefs, what are you going to do? Take each belief one by one and, and see if you can doubt it? Maybe you have thousands and thousands of beliefs, and if you just do that one by one, try to see if you can doubt them, it's going to take you years. But maybe there are certain things that can help you doubt a whole bunch of beliefs in one fell swoop. So Descartes contemplates various skeptical hypotheses to see how many of his beliefs they will undermine. So, for example, he considers that maybe he is undergoing a sensory illusion. So um, the skeptical hypothesis that maybe your senses are deceiving you, that, that your senses aren't working correctly, 
Well, what does that undermine? That undermines the sorts of things that you can you can see and, and feel, but maybe that leaves other things as well. Maybe there's still things that, that you wouldn't doubt just by contemplating the skeptical hypothesis that your senses aren't working correctly. So now imagine this. Imagine that there is a being that is so powerful, not only can they make you make your senses fail, but they can make almost all of your beliefs false. So you believe that there's trees outside, but this being can make it make it such that there are no trees. This being is as powerful as God, and God can make all the trees go away, or have made the world with no trees in it in the first place. And so if this being is as powerful as God, this being, this demon, can do that also. The demon could make it be the case that there never were any trees. And the being can make you believe that there are trees. So there's something you can doubt. You can doubt that there are trees. Even though you actually do believe there are trees, you can doubt it. And how can you doubt it? Well, you entertain this skeptical hypothesis. Isn't it possible that there is a demon that has put this false belief inside of your head? Isn't it possible that this belief is false and the demon made it so? And it, it might help to think about the correspondence theory of truth in connection with this. This is something that we discussed earlier. The correspondence theory of truth says something like, truth is relationship between a belief and reality. Now, you have a belief about trees, and then if that belief is true, there are trees. But trees are things separate from beliefs. You could have beliefs without trees and trees without beliefs. So isn't it possible then that this all-powerful demon could have made the world in such a way that there's you and your beliefs, and your beliefs say there are trees, but there are no trees. Isn't that possible? Well, that is a skeptical hypothesis. If that is actual, then you wouldn't know that there are trees in that situation. Now here's the next step. We take the, skept we take the skeptical hypothesis as a premise in an argument. Hypothetically, isn't it possible that a demon could make you believe that there are trees even though there aren't any trees? Yeah. Yeah. Now what? Well, doesn't it follow that you currently don't know that there are any trees? Wait a minute, how does that follow? Well, we might put it like this. For all you know, right now, there is a demon. Wait a minute, how do... Are you saying there is a demon? No, I'm not saying there is a demon. I'm not arguing that there is a demon. I'm arguing that you cannot, you cannot rule out that there is a demon. I'm not arguing that there is a demon. I'm arguing that for all you know, there might be a demon. Now, what if there was a demon? If there was a demon, you can have all the beliefs that you have now without any trees. So all of your beliefs about trees would be false, right? Right. Okay, so now, what reason do you have for believing that there are trees? What do you got to go on? Well, arguably, the only thing you got to go on is your own beliefs. All the beliefs you have might be false, for all you know. And so, therefore, you don't have knowledge of trees. So that is a skeptical argument. Um, but let's go back to Descartes. What's Descartes doing with the deceitful demon? One of the things that Descartes is doing with the deceitful demon is he claims he's discovered something that cannot be doubted. And some of you might have heard of this famous phrase that's associated with Descartes, I think, therefore I am. I think, therefore I exist. In Latin, cogito ergo sum. Consider the proposition, I think. Could the demon create me and the world in such a way that I think that I think, but it's false that I think. Is that possible? We might apply the correspondence theory of truth again here and see that, like, well, here's a big difference between the thoughts about trees. With thoughts about trees, there's a difference between the thought and the tree, and so you can have the one without the other. You can have the very same thought that there's a tree, and it could be true, or it could be false. It could still be the same thought. One version, there are trees. The other version, there aren't trees. But either way, you still have the same thought. 
But what if the thought is about itself? What if the thought is about thinking? Could the demon make you have that thought and also make that thought be false? No, because in this case, the correspondent, the thing that the thought has to correspond to in order to be true, is itself. So if you have the thought, you automatically have the truth maker for that thought, and you automatically have a true thought. Another way of putting the point of I think in connection with Descartes and this demon stuff is if you think I think, you now think something that is automatically true, and it's automatically knowledge. Here's another way to put it. You cannot doubt that you're thinking. You can doubt that trees exist, but you can't doubt that you're thinking. You could try to doubt that you're thinking, but that would just be more thinking. Doubting is a kind of thinking. So no matter what you do, doubt-wise, you're always going to still be thinking. So you know you're thinking. It's certain that you're thinking. There's no doubt about whether you're thinking. So there's at least one thing that Descartes knows for certain, namely, I think. That's something that not even a being as powerful as God would be able to make false. It would be guaranteed, be guaranteed to be true, no matter what else is going on in the world, no matter how powerful the demon is, it's still guaranteed to be true that Descartes thinks. Whenever Descartes thinks, that thought he's thinking is going to be true, as long as the thought is, I think. So now what? What follows from this? Well, it, it's supposed to follow from this that if I think, I must exist. So now Descartes knows two things. He knows that he thinks, and he knows that he exists. We'll talk more about Descartes and his related philosophy of rationalism in a later lecture. But that's the basic idea of the deceitful demon skeptical hypothesis. The hypothesis is that there is a being that's as powerful as God is supposed to be, but unlike God is very nasty and feels motivated to do things like to fool you. And you're supposed to imagine this possibility that the only things that exist are your mind and the demon. And the demon is putting false beliefs in your mind. That's the skeptical hypothesis. Is that possible? If that's possible, then aren't you not able to rule it out right now? You are unable to rule out that possibility. And if you're unable to rule out that possibility right now, doesn't it follow that you don't have knowledge about the things that the demon would be able to fool you about if the demon existed? You might say, this is crazy. There's no demon. I don't have to worry about it. But we're not arguing that there is a demon. We're arguing that there might be a demon. Are you in a position to say that it's impossible for there to be a demon? You might say it's very unlikely that there's a demon, but is it impossible? If it's at all possible, then you can't absolutely rule it out. And if it's, all po if it's at all possible, then maybe it's happening right now. And you wouldn't know whether it's happening right now, because all you have to go on are your beliefs, and you would have the very same beliefs. They would just happen to be false because the demon made them false. And this demon hypothesis undermines every knowledge claim about the external world. It doesn't undermine knowledge claims about the internal world, about the inside of your mind, at least specific ones like I think or, or my mind exists. Um, but it seems like every single belief that you have about things outside of your mind, well, those could, could be false. Because <coughs> you can't rule out from your point of view that they are false. Okay, here is the more science fiction-y contemporary version of the skeptical hypotheses like the brain, uh, but like the Plato's cave or the, the deceitful demon. And that is the brain in the vat skeptical hypothesis. The cave thing, you know, maybe it's hard for you to believe that someone, a human being, could be fooled by a bunch of shadows. Um, I mean, you have to imagine that they were in there as a little kid. If someone took you right now with all this 
knowledge that you have and stuck you in a cave. You probably figure out pretty rapidly that you're in a cave looking at shadows. And the thing about the demon, it involves like supernatural beings and 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 also like the version that Descartes tells your mind is a soul, your mind is a non-material thing. You wouldn't even have a body in the deceitful demon hypothesis. You just have a mind and maybe that's unscientific. So let's take this more scientific version. And that is that the only thing that exists about you is your brain. Like there's all sorts of things about you you think exist, like you think you have hands and stuff, but no, let's imagine that those don't exist. Just your brain. What's your brain doing? It's floating. Floating around in some liquid, the liquid's keeping it alive, and the brain is hooked up to a computer. You think you have eyeballs, and you think you have a mouth with a tongue in it, you could see things, and you could taste things, but really that's all just an illusion. The computer is hooked up directly to your brain via wires that are bypassing any sensory organs, and it's giving your brain the same sorts of signals that they would have gotten from your sensory organs. So, you might say, you've had surgery before. Uh, you remember that. If someone took your brain out of your body, wouldn't you remember that you went in for surgery? Well, I mean, maybe they did it in the middle of the night. Maybe you, uh, someone snuck up on you and, and drugged you, and while you were unconscious, then they performed the surgery. And then when you became conscious... You woke up in what you thought was just your bedroom. So for all you know, you went to bed one night, and then you wake up, and everything is normal. And it never occurs to you that actually what has happened in the middle of the night is that someone cut open your head and took your brain out, and then hooked the brain up to a computer and destroyed your body, destroyed the rest of your body. Would you be in any position to know that this had happened? You might say, no, I mean... All the things that I know are based on the senses, and the senses are just these things that are connected to the brain. Your ears, your eyes are body parts whose job is to collect signals from the environment and, and relay those signals to the brain. Couldn't the very same signals be given to the brain from the computer? If so, then nothing that you see, nothing that you hear, nothing that you taste guarantees that you're seeing or hearing or tasting the real thing. It's possible that you could have had the same experiences, but you've gotten them directly from the computer. One way of spelling this out is in terms of this argument, where we've got two premises leading to the conclusion that, for all you know, you're brain in a vat. And one premise that's really worth taking a look at, and we'll, we'll come back to again in a later lecture, is this first premise, It's a very plausible version of how perception works. So um, I perceive that th there is a guitar on the wall. When I have a perception, how does that work? In a very broad and philosophical sense, how does that work? Of course, there's scientific details that are interesting, but philosophically, maybe not relevant. It, it's not relevant whether the light goes into your retina and it and it in the the retinal ganglia are oriented, not, you know, at a 90 degree angle to the light beam or not. I mean, that's a scientific question that we don't need to get into in a philosophy class. But in a just general logic of perception, what does it mean for you to perceive something? We might say there has to be a thing, the thing that's perceived, and there has to be a causal relationship between that thing and your idea of that thing. That's what perception is. Not just any causal effect on you is perception. So like while you're asleep, you might get a, someone might sneak you into a tanning booth and give you a tan. That's a causal thing that happens. The ultraviolet light causes you to get tan skin. But that's not necessarily perception. You'd only perceive it if the cause, the causal procedure had an effect on your mind. Once there's some kind of effect on your mind, now we're in the ballpark of having a perception. So we might illustrate it in terms of perceiving a spoon. Whether you're seeing the spoon or hearing the spoon, whatever, we're talking about perceiving 
in general. There's the spoon itself, and that is the cause of this mental event, which is the, say, the current idea of a spoon. So you presently have an idea in your mind of a spoon, and that's caused by an actual spoon in your environment. So if that's what perception is, the relationship between cause and effect, well, what does that have to do with brain and, brain and that? Well, if, cause, if perception is the way you, like, if there is an external world and you have any knowledge of it, you do it by perception. I mean, that's basically what empiricism tells us, right? Well, um, whenever we're dealing with cause and effect, aren't we dealing with two things? One way we might put the point is that whenever we have causation, we're dealing with logically distinct existences. And this is something that Hume made a big deal about when he was talking about causation. That causation is not a logical relation. It's not a relation of logical necessity between two things. But instead, it's a relationship between two things that are logically distinct, meaning it's not logically necessary that if you have the one, that you have the other. Instead, that it's logically open that you can have the one without the other. So when there's cause and effect, there's always the logic, logical possibility of having just the one without the other. Let's go back just a little bit. Um, so let's take one sort of example. Um, We've got a ball flying, and then we've got a window breaking. Now, a window breaking, that's a kind of event. When a window breaks, is it true that there was a baseball that hit it? That a baseball flew? No, there's all sorts of different things that could have come before the window breaking. Maybe the window was, like, right before the window was breaking, someone, like, went up to it and hit it with a hammer. That's one way to break a window. There's all sorts of different things that could lead up to a window breaking, none of which have to involve a baseball flying. So window breaking is an event that's logically distinct from a baseball flying. How about a baseball flying? Does that always lead to broken windows? Well, some baseballs fly without being anywhere near windows, and some baseballs fly into windows and then bounce off without breaking them. So just because you have a baseball flying doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have a window breaking. Now, we take it to be the case that sometimes a flying baseball causes a window to break. So sometimes the one event is related to the other event as cause to effect. And of course, if something being an effect logically requires there being a cause, and being a cause logically requires there being an effect, but just being a, a broken window doesn't require logically that there was a flying ball. And just being a flying ball doesn't require logically that there's going to be a broken window. So that's what it means to say that if events are related by cause to effect, the events themselves must be logically distinct existences. But if perception involves logically distinct existences, on the one end in the external world there's the thing that's perceived, and on the other end, in the mental realm, there's the perception of that thing. If those involve logically distinct events, then given, for all you know, just given what's on the inside of your mind, there might as well not be what's on the outside of your mind. If we put this in terms of brains, given what's on the inside of your brain, it doesn't follow that there's necessarily one particular way that the world is. Maybe the, the way the external world is is very different. There's no spoon at all. There's just the fancy computer that is connected to your brain. So that's how this argument is supposed to work. We've got these two different premises, one saying that the way perception works is by relating an, an external cause to an internal effect. And then we've got this other thing about what generally happens with causation, which is it's a relationship between logically distinct existences and then we get this conclusion that for all you know, there's a completely different cause to all your perceptions. That really, 
your perceptions are just states in your brain that are being caused by the states of some virtual reality computer, you are, for all you know, a brain in a vat. Okay, so those are a few skeptical hypotheses that you could mobilize in a few arguments for skepticism, meaning external world skepticism, but maybe you don't want to be that kind of epistemologist. Maybe you don't want to be that kind of skeptic. Maybe you don't like external world skepticism. Is there anything you could say in response? Are there any responses to skepticism? And we're going to briefly look at two. One response to skepticism is a kind of famous and, and somewhat puzzling response from the philosopher G.E. Moore, and this is his famous two hands argument. G. E. Moore says, look, I can prove that there's an external world, and the proof is quite simple. Step one, here is one hand. <laughs> Step two, here is another hand. Conclusion, the external world exists. Now you might say, wow, that's, that's how philosophy works? Philosophy is pretty easy, I guess. You just need two hands, and you can defeat skepticism. But what really is going on here? What is the point of this argument? I have two hands. Like, if you really get your head around the deceitful demon thing, how is this supposed to destroy the deceitful demon? Like, if you really are worried about maybe that you're a brain in a vat, does G.E. Moore's hands thing really help? I mean, couldn't you just be hallucinating that you have hands? Couldn't someone in a dream say that you have two hands? And... Doesn't that mean this argument from G.E. Moore sucks? Like, so what? Uh, so what? You. So yeah, it seems to me like I have two hands. So what? It doesn't follow from that that I, I have two hands. And now here's one interpretation of the G.E. Moore argument. Maybe we can interpret it as going like this. You've got to start somewhere. And in order to get those skeptical arguments, like the brain and the vat, and the deceitful demon off the ground, you're starting with a bunch of complicated stuff. Stuff maybe about the correspondence theory of truth and a certain view about causation and a certain like technical philosophical view about how perception works. And maybe that's just like a lot of extra stuff that you shouldn't be helping yourself to. You shouldn't be starting off with. If you're looking for a starting place, why not just start with something simple like I have two hands? Start with that. I have two hands. You mean you're experiencing two hands? No, 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 no. I have two hands. Start there. Experience, that's fancy talk. Little kids don't talk about experience. When you when you teach little kids to speak, you teach them words like hands. You don't teach them like you have a red sense datum or you have you have the idea of a hand in your mind. You don't teach them that. You just say here's two hands. Um so maybe that's where you should start as a as a a lover of wisdom, as a philosopher. Start with, I have two hands. And anything that calls that into doubt is itself more suspect than this initial claim that you have two hands. So you have to, uh, who are you going to believe? You're going to believe, on the one hand, the claim that you have two hands, or are you going to believe, on the other hand, this complicated thing about the correspondence theory of truth and the causal theory of perception that ultimately leads to this ridiculous conclusion that you don't know that you have two hands? Who are you going to trust? What is a better place to start? So any, we might put it like this, any argument to a skeptical conclusion starts with way more stuff that is much more dubious than the very simple thing that is the opposite of that conclusion. And you should just start with the simple thing that you have two hands. You shouldn't let all this extra stuff come in if that's what the extra stuff is gonna is gonna do. Um, the premises of the skeptical arguments are far more dubious than the premises of this simple anti-skeptical argument. Here's another response to skepticism, and it's one we're gonna go into a lot more detail with in lecture 15 but here's a sneak preview. Maybe the best response to the skeptic is to just get rid of the external world. So the skeptic says something like, 
if there was an external world, you couldn't have any knowledge of it. And you might say, well, that sucks. I really want to have knowledge. So I guess I'm going to, let's just say there is no external world. Maybe then the right thing to say is that everything that is, is really in the mind. We might put this in terms of Descartes and the deceitful demon. So what's the deceitful demon supposed to be fooling you about? The deceitful demon is fooling you about what's going on outside of your mind. The demon can't really fool you about what's going on inside of your mind. You have all sorts of thoughts. That's what you are, is a bunch of thoughts. And so if you have the thoughts, you have the thoughts. And if you have the thoughts, you know that you have the thoughts. So maybe when I say things like there is a spoon, I'm really just talking about something on the inside of my mind. I'm talking about the sort of thing that the skeptical hypotheses about demons and stuff wouldn't undermine. So if what spoons are, are ideas in my mind, then spoons are the sorts of things I can have knowledge of. And so therefore, the skeptic about spoons is defeated. I do have knowledge of spoons. And we could take, we could do this with all of the stuff in the exter the so-called external world. I can have knowledge of it if it isn't actually external. It's actually internal. So one interpretation of this is that um, you're curing a headache by cutting off your head. Like, the problem is how to have knowledge of the external world. And the idealist is saying, here's how you have knowledge of the external world. You just get rid of the external world, man. So there's nothing to worry about. There's nothing to doubt you can have knowledge of. Um, or another interpretation is that they're just redefining external world as a certain region of the internal world. But that's kind of like saying we can achieve world peace by taking a ham sandwich and saying for now on, when I say world peace, I mean ham sandwich. So have I achieved world peace? Yeah, because I just had a ham sandwich. And for now on, that's what I mean by world peace. It's a kind of cheating. So this seems like a real philosophical problem, and that is how can we have knowledge of things outside of our brains or outside of our minds? And um, the idealist is just saying you can't. And that doesn't defeat the skeptic. It is just agreeing with the skeptic. So it's not, at least on this interpretation, not really a response to skepticism. It's not a counter-argument to skepticism. It's just like an addition to skepticism. Okay, so let's, uh, let's start wrapping this up with some study questions. Study question number one. Which would a skeptic be most likely to agree with? A, you are a brain in a vat. B, you can't rule out the possibility that you are a brain in a vat. Study question two. Which would a skeptic be most likely to agree with? You are not a brain in a vat. You don't know whether you are a brain in a vat. Some of you might be wondering, what, wasn't that question one? Did he just ask us the same question twice? I get accused of that a lot, but you know what? Often there's a little bit of a difference in the wording. A little bit of a difference in the wording. So pay attention to the wording. Question two is a different question from question one. Question three. Which does this best define? A hypothetical scenario in which you don't know what you would ordinarily think you know. So that's a definition of something. What's it a definition of? Is it A, skepticism, B, dogmatism, C, skeptical hypothesis, D, dogmatic hypothesis, E, dogmatic slumber? And here are the study question answers. Question number one, the answer was B. Two was also B. And three was C. And that brings us to the end of our discussion of skepticism. Or does it? How would you know? I don't know. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.